The point at which we have arrived, most of you will remember, in our study of the seventh chapter of Paul's epistle to the Romans, is uh, the beginning of verse 21. So let me read verses 21, 22, and 23. I find then a law that uh, when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward men, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Thus the apostle consider, continues this uh, great argument which he is developing as we have seen in this section. He goes on from point to point and step to step. He makes a statement and then he proves it. And then he takes up another and again demonstrates and proves that. He's virtually saying one big thing as we've seen. But he's anxious to make it so perfectly clear so that nobody shall be in any trouble in their minds with regard to this central matter of the place of the law in the life of the Christian. That's what he's concerned about. He's concerned to exonerate himself from various charges that were brought against him. But he's much more concerned to show the truth about the law, to show what the law was meant to do, and to show particularly what the law was never meant to do, and what it most certainly cannot do. That I keep on reminding you, as we start each time, is the real theme here, what the law could not do. And his point is that in showing that, he's not in any way derogating from the greatness of the law. He really is saying the truth about the law, but showing what it was designed and meant to do. Very well, we come to this particular statement which he makes in verse 21. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now, obviously, here in this statement, he is, in a sense, summing up what he's just been saying. The word then tells us that. I find them. Very well, he seems to say. This is what I find. This is my experience. This is what I have discovered. So, in a way, it is a summing up of uh, what he has been saying in the previous verses. And at the same time, he is repeating one of his general statements, which he's already made, for instance, in uh, verse uh, 14 and 15. For I know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin, and so on. But I think it's interesting to notice that it isn't just a repetition. The apostle never merely repeats what he'd been saying. He does re-emphasize, but generally you'll find that there's a, a shade of difference, that there is a slight difference. And the difference here is this. What he was concerned to show to us in the previous three verses, 18, 19, and 20, as we saw last week, his main thrust there is to explain why it is that he performs evil acts, though he doesn't want to do so. Now, what he's doing particularly in these verses that we're looking at tonight is this. He is showing why it is that he fails to do what he wants to do. You see, there are two things that are wrong with him. Two things wrong with this man. He does what he doesn't want to do. But he also fails to do what he wants to do. That's the dual aspect, you remember, of his problem. Now, in the previous verses, he was mainly concerned with showing why it was that he does the evil that he would not do. And he says he comes to this conclusion that it is no more he that's doing it, but sin that dwells in him. Now then, he now takes up the other side. Why is it that he cannot do what he really wants to do? That's what, that's what he's dealing with here. And this is what he tells us about it. Now he says, the conclusion I've come to is this. This is what I find. I find then a law. Now then, we must stop at once. 
Actually, what the apostle wrote was, I find the law, the law. Not a law, but he finds uh, the law. Now, what does he mean by the law here? He's been talking about the law uh, before, as we know. He says, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, uh, sold under sin. If then I do that, I would not I consent unto the law that it is good. Is he here talking about that same law? Well, obviously he isn't. He's no longer talking here about the law of God. Indeed, I can prove that to you very simply. This isn't a matter of opinion. This is really something that can be proved. If you look at verse 22, you'll find he says this, For I delight in the law of God after the inward men. Now, why does he suddenly call it there the law of God? So far, he's been referring to it as the law. We know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. If then I do that, I would not. I consent unto the law. He doesn't say the law of God in those two instances. Why? Well, because hitherto, he has only been talking about the law of God. But here in verse 21, he's talking about another kind of law, some other law. So then when he comes back to the law of God, he has to make it clear to us what he's talking about. And therefore he says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward men. That's his way of telling us that in verse 21, he was not talking about the law of God. It's a very important point for us to remember because we will find that he again uses this term law in still another sense. But there should be no trouble about it if you only pay careful attention to the way in which the apostle does it. It isn't then the law of God. Neither would I indicate. Is he referring here to the law of sin that dwells in him? I refer to that simply because Robert Holden, in some, to me, inexplicable manner, says that that is what this word law means here. That he finds the law of sin within himself, which works out like this, that when he would do good, evil is present with him. I suggest that he's not saying that. He says that later, but he doesn't say it here. Well, what is he saying here? Well, what he's saying here is this. He says, you know, what I find is this. This is my experience. There seems to be a principle working in me. Indeed, it's so much a principle that I can call it a veritable law. There seems to be a rule of action within me which is working in such a definite manner that it really is virtually a kind of law that is operating within me and in my experience. It seems to determine and to govern and to control what takes place within me. I, I find the law. Now that's, that's exactly what he means at that point. Or if you like, we can put it like this. He says, what I find is this that invariably, when I would do good, evil is present with me. That's what he's concerned to say here. This is something, he says, which seems to operate in me, uh, as you see, the laws operating in nature, as the night follows the day, as you get spring, summer, autumn, winter, that sort of law. I find, he says, that the moment I would do good, evil is present with me. As certainly as I want to do good, as certainly evil is there. Now, that's what he means by the law here. This is a law of his life and of his experience. It's so regular, it's so general, it's so certain. He says it, it seems to be an absolute law. I find the law. This seems to be now, he says, the rule in my life. Notice how he puts it. Evil, he says, is present with me. It means always at hand, always lying near. Whenever I will to do good, evil is always there, always asserting itself, jumping forward. The moment I act even with this mind of mine, evil jumps in, persistent in its opposition, never absent. It's an absolute law. I don't know any exceptions to this, he says. The moment I will to do good, evil is there. That's what he says. Now that is the essence of this Important statement in verse 21. Now then, verses 22 and 23 are just an exposition of that. You remember we found that verses uh, 
18, 19, and 20 were an exposition of verse 17. Well, here, verses 22 and 23 are an exposition of verse 21. That is the apostles' typical and characteristic method. You can't imagine a better one, can you? Proposition proof. Proposition proof. And on he goes, advancing the whole argument. Well, now then, let's, let's see what he's got to say. For, he says, letting us know that he's going to explain it. For. This is what it comes to in practice. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now, here is a very significant statement again. Take, uh, first of all, this word delight. You notice that there is a, a progression in the statements that he makes about the law. He started off in verse 14 by saying, we know that the law is spiritual. In verse 16, he says, I consent unto the law, the law that it is good. But now he goes beyond that. He says, I delight in it. This is stronger. This is taking it further. He, uh, he means by that, uh, not that he just uh, agrees with the law, or that the law is itself uh, uh, spiritual and good and uh, carries his consent and uh, his approbation. No, no, he says, I, I, I rejoice in the law of God. I exult in the law of God. He's taken it further. It's a very strong statement. It's the, he undoubtedly had in his mind here what the psalmist tells us in the first psalm about the good men whose delight is in the law of the law, in the law of God. You remember that statement about the good men there in the first psalm? Well, that's what he's saying. Uh, I uh, delight in the law of God after the inward men. Now then, here we come to a most important term, the inward men. This plays a very great part in the discussion about the exact interpretation of this passage. And uh, those who hold the traditional Reformed view have to lean very heavily upon this in their endeavor to prove that this is the regenerate men even at his very best. Uh, so they say that the inward men means the regenerate men, the new men, the new nature that is in this uh, saved person. But it seems to me that it doesn't follow at all of necessity that this is a reference to the new men that is in the believer. Because I want to put it to you that the apostle himself tells us what he means by the inward men in the next verse. Verse 23. Listen. For I delight in the law of God after the inward men, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Now then, there, you see, is a further explanation of what he means by the inward men. The inward men is surely synonymous with the mind. I delight in the law of God after the inward men. Then he puts that in verse 23 by saying, uh, what is in the law of my mind? Yes, there's something against that. That's what he's concerned about. So the inward men, I deduce, is the mind the understanding, the place of reason, the place where one is able to grasp the truth. I don't say for a moment that he's referring to that in the natural men, because we've seen so constantly, as we shall see here, that this cannot be a description of the unregenerate men. I mean a mind illuminated by the Holy Spirit. But I cannot see that we're entitled to claim more for this term than just that. I'm arguing that the reference to the mind, the law of the mind, in verse 23, gives us a definition of what the inward man is in verse 22. And, of course, especially when you see that he contrasts the inward man with the members. What do the members mean? Well, we've already discussed that several times in chapter 6. The members stands for the bodily organs. Uh, the, the, that part of men uh, through which he normally expresses himself and uh, uh, functions in his general life in this world. So the contrast is quite obvious. The parts of us with which we normally sin are the parts that we can see. 
the eye and various other parts, organs of the body. That's the outward man. What's the inward man? Well, it's the part of men that you can't see. You can't see a man thinking. You can't see a man's mind. You can see his brain, but you can't see his mind. That's why he calls it the inward man, as distinct from this outward man that is visible, uh, entirely or partially. And surely, therefore, there is no trouble about the meaning of the term the inward man. It is that hidden man of the heart, if you like. It, it, it is that part of men which is not visible. It includes the soul, of course. You can't see the soul. I think I quoted you before that foolish statement by that great anatomist, Sir Arthur Keith. Extraordinary how a great man could make such a statement. He said he had been an anatomist for so many years and had dissected so many bodies, he had never yet discovered in all his dissections a body, uh, an organ called the soul. Of course he couldn't. It's a part of the inward man. It's not visible. It's not outward and visible. It's invisible. But it's as real and more real than the things that you can see. It goes on with the bodies rotting in the grave. The inward man. I say the inward man stands for that invisible part of man. The most vital part of man. Soul, spirit, and so on. And including the mind, which is often used interchangeably with the spirit. Take, for instance, how the apostle puts it in 2 Corinthians 4.16. He says, though our outward men perish, now and he's referring to his body, he suffered a lot from sickness and illness, he suffered from weariness of the body, his outward men was decaying and dissolving. Though our outward men perish, yet the inward men is renewed day by day. It's the same big general contrast. And therefore it seems to me that we have no right to press this term, the inward men, any distance whatsoever beyond this general reference to that part of men that is illuminated by the spirit, the mind, the understanding, that part of men which eventually comes to see the truth as it is in Christ Jesus fully. So there, uh, I do suggest to you, he is referring to the mind, as he calls it here in verse 23, illuminated by the Spirit. In other words, what he's saying is this. I have now, he says, come to see the true meaning of the law. You know, he's been saying that almost non-stop since the seventh verse. There was a time when he didn't. He now has come to see it. The Holy Spirit has come upon him. The law has come. And he's seen it. He, the sin revived, he died. Yes, but the law has come. He understands now. He sees that the law is spiritual, that it is just and right and good, that it is holy, and all these other things that he says, even to the extent of saying that he rejoices in it. Very well. So we pause once more and look at his statement. I delight in the law of God after the inward men. A very important statement for this reason, that once again it puts right out of court any idea that this is the unregenerate men. That's why I'm emphasizing the word delight, you see. I delight in it, I rejoice in it, I make my boast in it, in the law of God. Why do I say this puts out the unregenerate for this reason? that he tells us in the next chapter, verses 6 and 7, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. That's your unregenerate men. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. No unregenerate man has ever said or ever can say, that he delights in the law of God after the inward man. So much for the idea that it is the unregenerate person. All right, but wait a minute. We must go on. Here we are then, we've arrived at this. He finds this is his daily constant experience that the moment he wills to do good, this other is there, present, suggesting, arguing, the fact is, he says, I delight in the law of God after 
my mind, my understanding, what I really regard as myself, not my organs, not my body, not my flesh, as it were. But uh, this higher part of me, I delight in the law of God. Well, what's the matter then? Why don't you carry out the law of God? Why don't you live it? Why don't you practice it? Oh, he says, here's the trouble. I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Now, this is, of course, one of those great crucial verses again. I regard this verse as being as crucial as verse 14. When we were dealing with that, I was emphasizing that it seems to me to control the whole exposition. I'd say the same about this one. So let's look at it very carefully. He says, I find another law. Now, another doesn't mean just another numerical. I've already found one law in my mind, but now I find law number two. No, what he means is a different one. It is number two, incidentally, but what he's emphasizing is different. Another in kind, altogether different. Not merely additional, but essentially a different one. Indeed, he is drawing a contrast. And he contrasts it with the law that is in his mind. So there's a law in his mind and there's a law in his members. Now then, what is this? Well, you notice that again he calls it a law in his members. Obviously this isn't the law of God. Obviously it isn't uh, the law that seems to be operating in his mind now that he's come to see the real meaning of God's law. No, this is yet uh, another law. What he means is that there is a permanent and controlling principle in his members that acts as a veritable law. That as you put your finger into the fire, you get burned. So, he says, this is what I find. There is this persistent, permanent, controlling power and principle in my members. It isn't something that's there sometimes and not at other times. It's always there. It's a law. It's as absolute as anything can be. It is always there and it's always operating. That's why he calls it a law in his members working constantly, resolutely, never fail. What does he mean by members? Well, we've already looked at that, haven't we? It's still the same as members in the whole of chapter 6. It is that which he contrasts, I would remind you again, with the mind. That's the way he looks at men, you see, at this point. Here is man in his mind, yes, and here's the rest of him. Bodily organs and appetites and all the rest of it. No, there's a law in the mind, but yes, but there's a law in this other part also. What does this other law do? Well, he tells us very plainly. It wars against the law of his mind. That's the first thing it does. Now, this word war is a very interesting one. I find another law in my members warring against. It means serving in a military campaign against. That's the original meaning. It, it, it comes from the word from which our word strategy comes. And it's a very good way of looking at it, isn't it? Here he is with his mind, you see, delighting in the law of God. Yes, but there's another law operating in his members and it's got a fiendish, devilish strategy. It's always fighting, it's watch, watching the moves of the other and it's countering every move. Strategy. serving in a kind of military campaign. What he means, of course, is this. That as certainly as he delights in the law of God with his mind and wants to do it, then this other law that is in the members, it begins to urge the opposite and puts it in an attractive form, dictates to him what he should do. The law, uh, he wants with the mind to serve the law of God, but this one then brings out all its reserves and its forces to make him not do that, but to do the exact opposite. But especially not to do that. That's the thing he's emphasizing here. He later, you see, in this same verse, calls it the law of sin. The law in his members and the law of sin are the same thing. They're identical. Now then, here is his picture. 
This, the first thing that this does is to wage this war against this spiritual view of the law and his desire to keep it because he now delights in it. But unfortunately it doesn't stop at that. That would be bad enough. The fact that this perpetual warfare was going on, I say, would be terrible enough to contemplate in and of itself that the moment the good asserts itself, the other asserts itself and does it with its devilish strategy. But he goes beyond that. It isn't merely that the law in the members is warring against the law of the mind. He says it brings me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Now then, here is the crucial statement, of course. Brings me into captivity. What does he mean by captivity? Well, everybody's agreed that it's a very strong word, and it means this. Making and taking prisoner. And indeed, again, I'm interested in the original meaning, which is this. The original meaning of this word takes you back to a spear. So what you've got to picture is this, you see. Here have two men been fighting. One of them beats the other. And the conqueror now is just pointing his spear at the body of the men he's conquered. He's taken him prisoner. Yes, but he hasn't merely taken him prisoner. He's got his spear pointed at him and says, if you try to get away, well, that'll be the end of you. The spear is there. And he says, now, I want you to walk from here to that door. Go along. And he follows him with the spear. That's the position. This man is entirely captivated. He's conquered. He's a prisoner. And he's absolutely helpless at the point of the spear. There he is. Now, now then, says Paul, that's what I find. I see this other law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into a position in which I'm a hopeless prisoner at the point of the spear. My captor has got me. That's the meaning of the word captivity. You notice that he says that it brings him into captivity. Bringing me into captivity. We're not looking now, you see, at either of the me's that we were considering last week in verse 18. We're looking at the man himself. I. This is the total personality. He isn't merely saying that it brings the sinful part of myself into captivity. You know, some of these expositors say that. But the moment they say that, they are falling into that dangerous, terrible heresy that I mentioned last week of dualism, in which they are saying, it isn't I who am in captivity, it's only my sinful part, it's only my body or something. That is that wrong division of men in which man says, I'm not sinning, it's only my body or the sinful part of the flesh that is sinning. And the law in my members is sinning. The law of sin in my members is sinning. He isn't saying that at all. He says it brings me, my total personality. I am brought into captivity to the law of sin that is in my members. He is not referring to the sinful principle only, but to himself. Very well, then, what is he saying in this statement? Which I remind you again is such a crucial one. Let me tell you, first of all, what he's not saying. Now, some of you may be familiar with the book of Marcus Rainsford and this great chapter. And Marcus Rainsford was a great commentator and a godly preacher. But he says that what the apostle is saying here is this, that he is referring to the fact of the presence, power, and tendency of indwelling sin as warring against the law of his mind. He says, that is all Paul is saying here. When Paul says, the law that is in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin that is in my members, he says he's referring to the fact of the presence, power, and then he puts in italics, tendency of indwelling sin as warring against the law of his mind. He says, Paul is putting there in very graphic language uh, that there is this tendency for that part of him to war against the law that is in his mind, to which I reply that Paul is not saying that. Paul is not merely describing the warfare. He does that at the beginning of the verse, but he says the warfare leads to defeat. He has been taken captive. He's not talking about a tendency. He's talking about a captivity. But listen, Robert Holden, how does he put it like this? 
How f- uh, Holden was in trouble here, clearly. He says, how far this captivity extends uh, cannot be known from the figure. All right, I'll agree with that, but I regard it as significant that he should have had to say that. He says, if the evil principle of our nature uh, prevails in exciting one evil thought, it has taken us captive. So far it has conquered, and so far are we defeated and made prisoners. Then he goes on to say this, but this is quite consistent with the supposition that on the whole we may have the victory over sins. So that what Paul is saying here is this, if you do uh, commit one sin, you have been taken prisoner and made captive by sin, but uh, on the whole, we may have the victory over sins. He says that that is what Paul is saying here. Listen to Paul. I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity in the law of sin. That means, according to Holden, that on the whole, we may have the victory over sin. Well, I don't know what your reaction is. I would have had the feeling that that's the exact opposite of what Paul is saying. That he is most certainly not saying that on the whole, we may have the victory over sin. He is saying on the whole, sin is having a victory over me. Well, now, wait a minute. Isn't the apostle I say saying that on the whole, he is defeated? He is not saying that he never has success. Of course not. There's no need to say that. The apostle is saying that looking at it on balance, on the whole, this is what he finds. This is the law of his being. This is the the regular state of his experience. Now, in a most amazing way, Marcus Rainsford refers to 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. And he does so, of course, very rightly, because the word captivity is also used there. Listen to 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity... There it is. Every thought to the obedience of Christ. Right? It's a most excellent quotation. Now, listen to Marcus Rainsford's comment on that, which is this. Here, he says in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, it is manifestly the aim and tendency of the warfare, not its invariable success to which, it le- to which he alludes. And he's absolutely right. Paul is not saying in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5 that every thought is always and invariably brought into captivity to the, to, to the obedience of Christ. He couldn't possibly say that, otherwise he'd be sinless and perfect. But what he is saying is this. He says, as Marcus Rainsford points out, this is the tendency. This is my prevailing position now. Though I'm in the flesh, I don't war after the flesh. No, no, I am warring after the Spirit, and this is the truth about me now speaking generally, that I bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. He may fail occasionally, but speaking generally, this is the tendency, as Marcus Rainsford uh, says so excellently. Yes, but uh, Dr. Marcus Rainsford seems to forget that if you say that so strongly about 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5... You must say the same thing about uh, Romans 7, uh, 23. It's he himself who's quoted it. He says now what Paul is talking about, not the invariable rule, but the general tendency. There may be occasional failures. All right, let's apply that to our passage this evening. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. The prevailing condition is that every thought is brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Occasional failure. That's the general rule. Now then, let's take all that and take it back here to Romans 7. I see then another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. 
What's he talking about? The general tendency. Exactly the same. The general tendency. That is what is gen not invariably true, as the other was not invariably true. This isn't invariably true. He doesn't always sin. No, but what he does say is, this is the general tendency. This is what is in general true of me. This is the general habit of my life. This is the law of my existence at this present time. That is it. Which is the exact opposite, you see, of what Dr. Marcus Rainsworth set out to say. What the apostle is asserting is this. Not merely that a fight is going on within him. That's the first part of verse 23. He tells us about the result of the fight. The outcome of the fight. And the outcome of the fight is, as I'm trying to indicate to you, that he finds in general that he is in captivity. He fails. The law that is in the members is too strong for the other law. That's what he's setting out to say. I find then a law that when I would do good evil is present with me. Though I delight in this law of God after the inward men, this other law keeps on coming in and brings me into captivity to the law of sin that is in my members. Do you require proof of this exposition? Well, you simply go on to the next verse. If Paul is here saying that on the whole he is able to live the Christian life and that on the whole we may have victory over sin, why in the name of conscience, I ask, does he go on to say, O oh, wretched men that I am? The thing is meaningless. It is senseless. What makes him say, O oh, wretched men that I am? is the persistence of defeat, is the feeling that he's down rather than up, that it's failure rather than success. I cannot see how any other exposition of verse 23 can possibly lead us to verse 24. If he is merely describing the fact that there is a conflict in the life of the believer in verse 23, that doesn't lead him to say, Oh, wretched men. No, no. There is nothing that leads to this except defeat. Failure. What does wretched mean? Well, it's a cry of anguish. It's a cry of hopelessness. There is a tinge of despair in it. The very word means this. And this isn't my opinion. This is what all the lexicons will tell you. Wretched means exhausted as the result of hard labor. He's been striving and striving until he's weary and tired out and wailing. And so he cries out like this. Oh, wretched men that I am. He's not merely saying that because there is this other part in me. No, I myself am wretched. And then he cries out saying, who shall deliver me? Now in a most amazing way again, Robert Holden says at this point that this shall refers entirely to the future. He emphasizes the shall. Meaning this, says Holden, that he knows that nobody can do it now, but that it is going to happen. He says this is the Christian man at his best. He knows that he'll never be delivered while he's in this life and in this world, but he knows that at the end, in death, Christ will finally deliver him out of the body and its thraldom and he'll have the glorified body. Shall, he says, is entirely future. Such, I think, is the position in which you inevitably find yourself if you've started in the wrong way in your interpretation of this passage. This isn't some reference to some remote distant future. Here is a man in anguish, in failure and exhaustion says, Who will deliver me? Who can deliver me? That's what he's saying. That's a part of the very question. He's not a man making a pronouncement about what's going to happen. He's crying out in despair for deliverance. The body of death, we needn't stay with this. This is the same as the law of sin in my members, the thing he's just been talking about. At the end of 
verse 23, he says, this is the trouble that this other law in my members is bringing me into captivity to this law of sin that's in my members. Who shall deliver me from this law of sin that is in my members, which he calls this body of sin, this body of death. It all hangs in together. He wants deliverance from this part of himself that is opposed to the inner man, opposed to the law of the mind. And he wants to be delivered. What is this thing? Well, I want to quote you Marcus Rainsford again because it helps to bring out the positive exposition. He says it means this, that Paul was really saying, O oh, wretched men that I am, to have anything in me contrary to my God, contrary to his Christ, contrary to his cross, contrary to his spirit, contrary to his will. That's what it means, he says. Here's the fully regenerate man. And you see, he finds that the mere fact that there is anything in him, contrary to my God, contrary to his Christ, contrary to his cross, contrary to his spirit, contrary to his will. To which the only reply I would make is this. Does a man who knows Christ, does a man who knows about the cross, does a man who knows about the Spirit, simply cry out saying, Who shall deliver me? Does he use this indefinite term, who? No, no, the man Paul's talking about is a man who doesn't know yet. All he knows is that he can't deliver himself. His knowledge of the law can't help him. He, he delights in it, but still it's of no value. This other law is too much. He says, who can? I can't. Does he know about Christ? Well, why doesn't he mention him? Why doesn't he cry out to him? Does he know about the Spirit? Well, then why not call upon him? And why not say, I can't, but the Spirit can? Here's a man who says, who can? He's in trouble. He is in a desperate plight. And in a desperate position. Surely all these statements go together, they hang together. Each one comes out of the other. This man is wretched. Conscious of complete failure. Aware that there is this other power in his members that he cannot master, but it's mastering him. It's always taking him into captivity. He cries out in his anguish, O oh, wretched men that I am, who shall deliver me? He is not bemoaning the fact that there's anything in him contrary to his God, his Christ, the cross, the Spirit. They are not mentioned here at all. You see, on that other exposition, you have to import all that. But it's not here. Not here at all. It's in the next chapter in great profusion, but not here. And yet we are concerned about the man who is here. This is the man we are dealing with. The man who is in a position that he simply can cry out, Who can, shall, will deliver me? There he is. What astounds me is that our good friends, these great men, because of a controlling theory with which they began, can allow themselves to have to resort to these devious ways of attempting an exposition. Now, we'll go on with this next time, God willing. We'll just glance at the remaining statements and then gather up all this evidence that we've been garnering and accumulating. We'll try to collate it all and put it all together and see what the composite picture is of the man that is depicted here by the Apostle Paul. We have seen one thing very clearly, I think, and that is it is not the unregenerate man. We've seen another thing equally clearly, that it is a man who has come to see the spiritual nature and character of the law. we leave it at that for this evening. Let us pray. O oh Lord, our God, we thank thee again that we come unto thee and call thee our Father. That we come pleading that name that is above every other name. 
that we come into thy presence not despairing but confident. We thank thee that we know whom we have believed and are persuaded that he is able to keep that which we have committed unto him against that day. O oh God, we thank thee for the verities, the certainties of the faith, the assurance which thou hast so graciously given us. Receive, O oh God, our humble prayers at the way in which thou hast delivered us from our wretchedness and sense of hopelessness. Receive our prayers as we offer it in his name alone through whom it has come to us and who made it possible by coming into the world and humbling himself and bearing our sins and conquering all our foes and rising again and who is seated at thy right hand in glory. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now this night and evermore. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.